mean they ate each other up? Huh? They had to, in order to survive. Yeah. Don't worry, Mom. I know all about cannibalism. I saw it on TV. The Shining is a film famously about ghosts. But this opening conversation on the drive to the Overlook Hotel reminds us of a different return of the dead, a figure that is now culturally more pervasive than the ghost. As an increasing number of reports of serious attacks on people who are literally being eaten alive. The zombie. Immaterial echoes of the past have given way to carnal excavations of humanity. If a ghost is a soul without a body, a zombie is a body without a soul. But the same can't be said of the cannibals who increasingly seem to be replacing their undead counterparts. Flesh eating is no longer about the dead, but the living. And perhaps it speaks to something more human than monster. As a mortician tells a detective in the Mexican film, We Are What We Are, it's shocking how many people eat each other in this city. Horror tends to be a genre that eats itself. This is true of a lot of cinema, but with the endless parade of remakes and reboots, sometimes it's as if these films don't even chew before they swallow. And that's not necessarily a criticism. It's that these monsters are bigger than any one story. Ghosts, vampires, werewolves, their mythology lays the foundation for a specific thematic exploration. And in the case of cannibalism, that exploration is of exploitation and humanity. Whether it's capitalism, consumerism, social power or societal standards, these are exploitation films in more ways than one. But when it comes to flesh-eating, despite being the less alive of the two, it's the zombie that most directly interrogates our humanity. Is this cannibalism or anthropophagy? The consumption of human flesh by a non-human animal? What does it mean to be human? It's through this question that Julia de Corno's 2017 film, Raw, about a student's sudden intense hunger for human flesh, has as much in common with zombie cinema as it does with its cannibal predecessors. Just that its point of comparison isn't the undead. Set in a remote veterinary school, the students are surrounded by other animals, both living and dead. And these visuals repeatedly ask how much are we like them? Les cochons, c'est presque comme les hommes. Je sais pas si vous avez appris ça. But rather than an intellectual or emotional comparison, the connection between human and non-human comes more from the juxtaposition of bodies and even what we might consider to be the most majestic creatures are still subject to their body. Speaking about the women in the film, de Corno insisted that a body is a body. They are not these heavenly creatures, they're real people. And when they go down, they go down. This approach to the body questions our control, our agency, and most pressingly, our identity. De Corno continues, I was aware that my body could mutate in unexpected ways and have autonomy. You haven't decided to have a rash. It's your body doing it. So are you your body or is your body you? So the question is not only what does it mean to be human, but what does it mean to be me? And if the distinction between mind and body is erased, if maybe all we are is our bodies, that gives rise to the idea that our very being could be consumed. In an article for The Quietus, Richard Hurst considers that the fear evoked by zombies is that perhaps you are simply a sack of meat, as susceptible to the demeaning process of being ripped apart, wolfed down and excreted as any other animal. But this goes further than what we might immediately associate with the word body our flesh or limbs, given the cultural consensus on the zombie's specific desire for brains. While a diet of brains wasn't really associated with zombies until Return of the Living Dead in 1985, it's become part of the traditional zombie mythology, possibly thanks to the Simpsons Treehouse of Horror segment Dial Z for Zombies in 1992. Brains! Brains! And though it hadn't featured that prominently in zombie films, the recent CW show iZombie repeatedly reinforces this image of brain as food. It's this brain eating that reminds us that everything we are, not just our bodies but our thoughts and feelings and memories, is all technically edible. 
and is equally capable of being consumed. Philosopher Julia Kristeva defines this as abject horror, a horror that disturbs identity, system, order, a terror that dissembles, a hatred that smiles, a passion that uses the body for barter instead of inflaming it, a debtor who sells you up, a friend who stabs you. But Kristeva later asks, does not fear hide an aggression, a violence that returns to its source, its sign having been inverted? In Raw, our protagonist is not the one in danger of being eaten. Rather, it's she who might become dangerous. Her fear is only of her own desires and urges, of her own body. So is this fear, as Kristeva asks, I am afraid of being bitten, or I am afraid of biting? Ducorno explains that cannibals are always portrayed as a they. For me, when I hear they, I think of creatures from outer space or zombies. I would make it an I movie. It's not like before she's human and after she's not human anymore. All along, she's human. The shift in perspective is part of a wider trend in monster media. And when it comes to people eating protagonists, like Justine, their experience is often one of rejuvenation or awakening, especially with the zombie metaphor lending itself so well to images of passive routine. I don't feel dead and undead. I feel the opposite, totally alive. But I don't think Raw can be reduced to a coming of age metaphor or a sexual awakening, despite the presence of both. An animal qui a bouffé de la chair humaine, c'est pas safe. It's this idea of tasting human flesh that obviously draws a parallel with sex. But unlike the frequent sexualization of something like vampirism, this tasting isn't sexy. Because cannibalism isn't about tasting, it's about devouring. This is hunger as a need, a primal, ingrained desperation, an obsession described by the director as a love that is too much, where we consume each other where, like the Donner Party mentioned in The Shining, eating each other can feel like a matter of survival. And nowhere is this intensity more apparent than between siblings. The betrayal of a sister can feel just like your own body has turned on you. There's no other who is closer to the self. You can think you know your family, your body, yourself. But Roar is consistently concerned with the rough edges of expectation of sexuality, of diet, of achievement, of bodies, of beauty, of society and hierarchy. There's always more beneath the surface, and it's probably bloody. But just because we recognize these destructive impulses, it doesn't mean we should give in to them or let them overwhelm us. Like its name, Raw is unpolished and isn't concerned with neatly answering all the questions it poses. It's more about slowing down long enough to examine the darkness, to acknowledge it, our attraction to it. Justine is told by her sister that beauty is pain, but just as it only takes a few seconds to move from hair removal to a severed finger, Raw isn't interested in being beautiful. This pain isn't about beauty, it's about growth. As poet Rainier Maria Rilke explained, they wanted to bloom, and to bloom is to be beautiful, but we want to ripen, and for that we open ourselves to darkness and travail. Because one thing the film does seem sure of is that cannibalism can be used not as a metaphor for losing humanity, but finding it. De Kuno asserts that it's through her so-called monstrosity that Justine has experienced for the first time a real moral choice that makes her inevitably human. I can kill, but I won't. This is an alternative vision of cannibalism on film, influenced by existing ideas, by those expectations, but not defined by them. Shifting the focus from the detachment of mind and body to the closeness that would allow something like a zombie virus to spread in the first place. In The Cannibalist Manifesto, Oswald de Andrade proposed that only cannibalism unites us, socially, economically, philosophically. The unique law of the world, the massed expression of all individualism and collective movement. I said before that horror eats itself, and that it isn't necessarily a bad thing. 
that repeated devouring can come from a place of love, a reverence for what has already been, a desire to exalt it, to make it a part of ourselves. But it is also about owning, possessing, destroying. So though we might fear being consumed, we should be just as wary of our own hunger. Thank you.